there are a couple of more things I would like to bring up, and that actually relates to what you just mentioned here, John, the maintenance therapy. So uh, uh, what's your personal uh, approach when it comes to maintenance? Do you use maintenance for all your patients, and what type of therapy do you use? All the phase three trials have shown that whether you call it continuous therapy or maintenance therapy in multiple myeloma, has definitely prolonged the progression-free survival. And in some of the cases, it has also improved the overall survival. And this is important. Uh, we can, going forward, we'll get greater insight as the MRD is being tested sequentially. We do know when we use maintenance therapy, some of these patients who were MRD positive or actually minimal disease detectable by, even by serum protein electrophoresis, with the maintenance therapy over a period of time, whether it's lenalidomide or any other drug in combination, you would see that clone disappears. Right. So the question is whether the clone would have disappeared by itself or not. That has been addressed on the phase three trial that after the maintenance, more patients are in complete remission and deeper remission compared to the patient who are not given maintenance therapy. So I do believe that the maintenance therapy is very important for the management of uh, multiple myeloma. So what's the payer perspective? Maintenance therapy, that's expensive, it's continuous. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not only expensive for payers, it's expensive for patients too. So, but, uh, but I agree, the clinical trials show that maintenance therapy improves overall survival compared to no maintenance therapy. So, uh, and it's in the NCC and guidelines, so we're gonna pay for it. I think that the real challenge though um, is not understanding uh, what the, uh, how long do you need to be on maintenance therapy if, if you're in MRD or if you're MRD negative? Um, because, for example, a patient who's on lenalidomide, even in their, in, for Medicare beneficiaries who are in their uh, catastrophic coverage, they have, they have to pay 5% of the cost of the drug. So for a lenalidomide, that might be $1,200 a month. You ask that patient to pay $1,200 a month times 12, that's $14,000 a year for the next however long. So I think it's incumbent upon us to not only understand the, the benefits of maintenance, but when do those benefits begin to diminish and, and, and they're no longer uh, needed. So from a payer perspective, yeah. I'm thinking of a couple of scenarios here. Yeah. So you could think of using combinations that are quite expensive, uh, followed by maybe continuous maintenance, or you could do combinations up front that are very expensive, mm -hmm. but maintenance maybe could be shortened, uh, and maybe there could be patients reaching sustained MRD negativity yeah. without. So all the discussions on the payer side uh, when it comes to these types of perspectives? I don't think so. I, I think the, uh, the, we have to be driven by the evidence and what the clinical trials support and what the NCCN guidelines support. And if they support that we're gonna drive more people into MRD negativity with multi-drug combinations, then that's what we're gonna have to, that's what we're gonna have to fund. So the payer's role is more to kind of follow the data and uh, make decisions based on the evidence. Well, yeah, uh, because I, any decision that I make uh, as a payer or any other payer makes, we have to be able to support that with the evidence. We can't be arbitrary and capricious in what we cover. So it does have to be driven by the evidence. And, and, and when you uh, use something off-label, uh, if you have evidence to support off-label use and that's generally accepted, then, then we'll cover that. So I, I don't think we're unreasonable in our decisions, but we also have a fiduciary responsibility uh, to the government uh, and to employers who pay for health care insurance and individuals who pay for health care insurance uh, to make sure that they're getting um, evidence-based care. John, in this regard, I have to tell you, in, in your pers from your perspective too, the field is moving uh, dramatically different. Before, we had to wait for uh, clinical trials, which was designed and predominantly funded by pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. But now you are able to get real world evidence. Even though we say we want to continue, let us say, uh, a maintenance drug, uh, an immunomodulatory molecule or something uh, until they progress. But the real world evidence shows that uh, the median time they are on that particular drug is around 18 months. Mm -hmm. So During maintenance? The, yeah, during the maintenance. Okay. So even yeah. though my intent is to continue longer, at the bedside for various reasons, either because the patient, some of them had progressed, some of them had unique toxicity, then the quality of life gets affected, so, so on and so forth. And some occasionally could be the financial toxicity, what they can and cannot. 
So the real world evidence would also give us information and insight which previously was not available to us, which was strictly data driven. And the problem with clinical trial data as a physician taking care of all comers uh, while participating in clinical trial is you do know that 10% of the patients are on clinical trial, 90% of the patients are not on clinical trial. Uh, many of the patients in the community at large, so, somebody could be 86, somebody could have a coronary artery disease, somebody could have atrial fibrillation, uh, may not be an ideal candidate, was not eligible for clinical trial, if you look at the eligibility criteria. But they are the bread and butter. These are the patients who have to be cared for. So I would somewhat say, I understand the big picture, the cost, containment, etc. I think we need to look at the real world evidence no matter what, the SEER data and the European population-based data clearly shows as we brought new drugs, more patients are living longer. And we also uh, show that the maintenance therapy really prolongs. But the real-world data will also shed a lot of information which we do lack at this time.